Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. We've been dying to do this episode for a while. Nailed it, Dan. Nailed yeah. it. Yeah. I'm really on fire today, and I feel good about it. Uh, we've got Dr. Cyril Wecht on the show today, who is uh, one of the very best in their field. Um, my gosh, man, you've, I feel like you've done it all. Uh, you're a, a forensic uh, pathologist. Um, you're also an attorney and a medical legal consultant. Uh, what haven't you done in that field? Well, I appreciate, first of all, gentlemen, uh, you're having invited me to participate in the program. It's a great opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with your millions of listeners. Um, thank you very much. Well, I uh, have done a lot in legal medicine and forensic pathology. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to become involved uh, by way of consultations from families, attorneys, uh, news media, and government agencies in a variety of uh, cases, going back to uh, JFK, mm -hmm. which was my first uh, big introduction into the mm, case of national uh, celebrity and controversial cases, and continuing all the way through uh, to the present time. I've uh, dealt with attorneys in civil and criminal matters from all over the United States, and indeed uh, from perhaps a dozen different countries. I've testified in several different countries uh, about some of these cases, and I have also been invited to lecture on some of these cases in many countries, particularly the JFK assassination. Yeah, you've done over 17,000 autopsies that you've uh, Well, it's, it's 21,000. You have the old. Mm, uh, you've uh, done four thousand since then. You were yeah. busy. Well, I, I, um, <laughs> well, I, I average. I average. Um, I, I, I do um, now um, between my colleague and me um, about two hundred and seventy a year. Prior to her coming on board, and uh, two and a half years ago, I was doing more than five hundred myself. So since I started doing these medical legal autopsies in 1962, uh, and before that, all of the hospital autopsies from 1957 uh, for those uh, four or five years uh, before I went into forensic pathology, you can see how those numbers added up. And then I've reviewed, supervised, or signed off on about 41,000 other autopsies. Wow. Yeah, your, your numbers are crazy, and, and you're one of those guys where as soon as someone sees your face, you're like, wait a minute, isn't that guy in that one murder show testifying about everything? And you're like, yeah, my wife is oddly into murders. Um, Not oddly. Every white woman in America sits around all day listening to, uh, to uh, true crime documentaries and podcasts and whatever else. So this is yeah, she's trying to find a special way on how to get away with murder. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what it is. They're all super unhappy with their husbands. They're just trying to figure it out. But here's what, what I, I, what I find, and exactly, here. and here's what I find super odd about this is you have become a celebrity in your own right um, from doing all of these shows, but just as a, as a profession that you actually do in real life, did you ever think it would get to where it is as far as like uh, most of these murder cases going uh, around the world and, and being extremely famous and stuff like that. I know you've worked on the JFK thing and, and obviously that's an obvious one, but some of these others, you had to sit back and be like, really, everybody wants to keep hearing about this over and over again. Uh, yeah, no, well, there's no way in which I planned uh, this nor uh, uh, in, in, in any way in which I anticipated all of this and it all started with uh, my presentation of a paper at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences in February 1965, reviewing the Warren Commission report. Mm -hmm. And then it just mushroomed since that time to the present time. And then following JFK uh, in various ways, sometimes through colleagues who consulted me, like Dr. Tom Noguchi in the RFK assassination and the Sharon Tate LaBianca murders and the Patty Hearst, the Civinis Liberation Army cases. Um, and then uh, from others um, that have continued through the years. And then Dr. Martin Luther King, um, I uh, participated in the autopsy on James Earl Ray. And then going through the years, uh, Elvis Presley and um, Gene Harris, and um, then the Waco Branch Davidian, and uh, Sean Halevy, and on into Ron, Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown, White House Counsel Vincent Foster, um, O.J. Simpson, John Benet Ramsey, um, 
and um, Phil Spector, and I'm sure many others that I've forgotten um, uh, to mention. So these cases have indeed the mushroom. And I have taken the opportunity to put many of these together in summary fashion, along with other autobiographical material in my book, which was just recently published, my autobiography, uh, just about three weeks ago, uh, The Life and Deaths of Cyril Weck, um, Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist. I, I, I recommend that book for people who are interested in uh, true crime, in forensic science, and in many of these cases, as well as further background information about the criminal justice system, how it works, how it can be perverted, how it can be thwarted, uh, how it can be uh, suppressed and uh, manipulated by governmental agencies, by private individuals, and so on. Uh, so uh, think about that. Um, the uh, cases are, are fantastic, and people continue to be interested. I just uh, had a call earlier today, and we'll be doing a program once again on Brittany Murphy. I've done Brittany Murphy case uh, in Australia. I've done Brittany Murphy case um, in other parts of the country. I did a Kurt Cobain case a couple of months ago for a station in in, in Athens, uh, Greece. Uh, it, it's just, I'm telling you, it's yeah, all yeah. over the world. People are fascinated by these cases. They yeah. are. And I, look, I, I watched that Kurt Cobain doc on uh, Netflix that you did. Soaked in, soaked in bleach. Soaked in bleach. Yeah. And it was fantastic. And uh, to be honest with you, there's some conspiracies I'm not willing to entertain where I just think it's too much. Um, yeah. Even the Kurt Cobain one, in my opinion, right? And then I watched Soaked in Bleach, and I was like, ah, maybe, maybe they're right. Um, let's, I, since we're, you've done everything there is, let's start there, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of go backwards into some of our favorite hits, like JBR and OJ and those guys. Um, with Kurt Cobain, in that movie, uh, they, they bring up the, the possibility that it was uh, Courtney had hired someone to kill Kurt Cobain. Do you believe that Kurt Cobain killed himself or, or someone else had? I believe that he killed himself, and let me tell you why. I, I deal with hard facts, and I, you know, I agree with you. Some conspiratorial uh, theorists, uh, people that are all over the place, and I am constantly rejecting some of these uh, uh, people's theories and thoughts. They go too far. So I'll give it to you, Kurt Cobain, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. there um, in the fancy uh, apartment above the garage, separate from his house, an, a known drug addict, uh, as well as, of course, the great musical celebrity that he was. Mm -hmm. So he had his own special kit, a beautiful brown leather case in which he kept a syringe, a needle, a tourniquet, the drugs, um, band-aids, um, um, a uh, skin um, a cleanser, and so on. So here's what you have to believe if you believe that it was a suicide. Kurt Cobain injected himself with heroin, a quantity sufficient if it were divided into four parts, aliquots, it would have been enough to kill four different people, okay? And my, at that point, man, you're in heaven, you're in nirvana. Mm -hmm. You know, many, many of the drug deaths that we deal with, the needle is still in the person's arm, right. or sometimes it's just found right there near by the syringe. So here's what you ask, are asked to accept in Kurt Cobain, if you go with the suicide. He injects himself with that amount, which takes effect immediately mm -hmm. injected into the vein. You understand that it goes into the uh, venous system and hits the brain in seconds. He takes the needle out of his arm. He detaches the needle from the syringe. He cleans it off. He places both the syringe and the needle, having cleaned out the syringe also, places them back into this special kit. The tourniquet also cleans off the skin, closes it up, packages it, sets it aside, then he reaches over, takes the shotgun, and shoots himself. And the position of the shotgun was not either in a position in which you would expect it to have been had he shot himself. So, and you say, how could this have been? Well, the police who came there, and they weren't even experienced criminal homicide detectives, they just assumed that it was a suicide. That's what was reported to them, and that's what it looked like, and so on. They never did a scene investigation trace evidence, physical evidence, uh, fingerprints, footprints, and so on. Nobody was ever interrogated. No, whether it was Courtney Love, uh, his wife from whom he was in the process of obtaining a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I don't know her, I've read about her. She uh, apparently a controversial, um, tough cookie uh, in her own right. Um, 
Uh, I'll leave that for someone else to ascertain. But yeah, I, I, I've, 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 I've met her in real life. life. You, you, yeah. you figure it out. I've never seen anything like that ever in my life or have I ever heard of anything like that. Wait, so you still think that Cobain killed himself, though, right? Well, no, no, no. You don't I'm believe sorry. that. I, I don't see. think yeah, okay. I'm sorry if I did not make that point clear. No, it's, I no, it's fine. I just wanted to. Have protected himself in that state that he was in psychologically, right. emotionally, from a pathophysiological standpoint, that he was then going to either have the need uh, or the desire or the ability to go and take the shotgun and shoot him. No, I do not think that he shot him. Yeah, that's, uh, that is a lot to, you, you really have to suspend your disbelief a number of different ways to believe it. Yeah, and, and I, I have met her and she is crazy. And it also wouldn't put put it, I don't. Well, that's not I a don't fact think, though, that's just your no, okay, but I'm telling you, when you when you get to know her, like she, I, I understand that, but she was concerned about the money, um, and they made this point in the documentary where, uh, you know, because the the band Hole hadn't blown up yet, like it hadn't taken off until after he committed suicide, and there was so much fascination into the group Hole, and in particular her after she gave that speech in front of all those people crying, and it got a ton of press that it was like. All right, but what happened up until that point? And then why were you so ready to drop an album? What was it, eight days after he died? Right. Um, she always has seemed like she needed money. She's continued to sell bits and pieces of that back catalog, which you know the members of Nirvana are pissed about. Like um, this was the first documentary that laid it all out and and posed the questions of like, how could someone else do this? Now there was a, a guy there, like a groundskeeper or something. Uh, that they said Courtney was talking to. Do you have any uh, guesses on who it would have been besides Courtney? Because I don't think she could have pulled the trigger herself. She was no. I, I don't think that she herself pulled the trigger. Most unlikely. Um, I, I would only say this: um, that people who are interested in this case should see Soaked in Bleach. I have no financial interest in that documentary at all. I want to make that very, very clear. So I'm not promoting that. I do work with the people that did. Uh, write it and produce it, a very serious, intelligent um, uh, gentleman. And um, I, this is all I can say. Uh, watch Soak and Bleach and you arrive at your own conclusion. That's what I love about uh, your stuff, though, because, look, there's a lot of documentaries and biopics that take a lot of liberties with evidence, as it were. And uh, you're kind of known for uh, not giving a shit, for lack of a better phrase, about how the information is going to affect anybody. The information is the information. Facts are the facts. We present yes, the facts. Yes, you have to right? deal with forensic scientific facts. You know, I've been in this business now since I finished everything in law and physical biology in 1962. So that is, uh, what, 58 years. I've been doing medical legal consultations. And, and I don't say this in a negativistical way, but if you uh, manipulate, if you engage in conjecture, if you come up with answers and comments that are appropriate and necessary by somebody at that time and then do something of an inconsistent nature later on, that's going to come back to haunt you. Right. There's no way in the world that I can continue to be functioning successfully with cases coming in every week from all over the country. Um, I just got a case from Israel uh, last week of a homicide there, I, for sometimes from around the world. If, 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 you, if you don't maintain your credibility, yeah. if people, you know, and nowadays, don't forget it, you gentlemen are, are skilled at this. Um, it's not like the old days where you would have to go back and get transcripts and so on. Nowadays, you press a button here, press a button there, and you can find out what somebody said in the Jones case, what somebody said in the Smith case, and then you have all the records immediately at your disposal. So inconsistencies would, would stand up. Like like a glaring light in the middle of total darkness. And how long would it take before somebody would confront you with this? And, you know, you would lose all of your credibility. So I'm proud of the fact that my record is out there. And, and not because I'm always right and there are people can't disagree with me. And I want to make that clear that there are things in pathology and medicine which are not tangibly, uh, concretely, 100% certain. The only scientific entity that is 100 percent absolute is cellular dna everything else is sub susceptible subjective to interpretation uh and so on so 
Uh, like, the, like the comorbidity debate that's going on with COVID right now. Human beings well, yeah. that aren't medical scientists don't understand what that means or what the implications are. And, you know, the government and media, depending on where you fall on the spectrum, use right. that information in a way without explaining the context. And then people find out there is context and they weren't told about it. And that builds distrust in the institution. That is a problem, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's a problem that people don't understand it, but it's also a problem that we didn't take the time to explain all this stuff to people. And now they think they're being lied to. In a lot of cases, the truth is being massaged, like yes. deep tissue massage, right? I mean, it's, yeah. there, a lot of things are, are happening that are very weird right now. I wonder, from your perspective, if so, as somebody who, like you said, for the last half a century has, has been working in this field that depends on science and facts and, and, and at a level where you're dealing with the government vis-a-vis -vis in investigations and uh, the criminal justice process, how do you feel right now about the very clear lack of trust in pretty much any institution, particularly science and government in the U.S. right now? Well, um, it's, it's unfortunate. At the same time, uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, good to have occurred. If you go back uh, to the early 60s, when the JFK assassination occurred, and even into RFK and MLK um, five years later in 1968, you have a period in which everybody accepted what the government told them. There was, you know, question, government wouldn't lie to them and so on. Right. You and mean you like the, uh, all the information put out in the 1950s about heart disease, for example? None of, none of which is true. Right. And some of it is still on, like, gov like on uh, government websites about the food pyramid and making sure you get enough grains in your diet. Like, come on, man. We, it's still, it's like the government still put some of that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. dude, none of that is true. Uh, that, that's right. And it wasn't until later years that people began to question many things. And as you guys know, with your military background um, and so on, um, we're, we're still learning, aren't we, about some things that happened in the Korean War and the Vietnam War and so on that were obscured, that we were lied to, and so on. I had the great pleasure many years ago, one of the nice things about growing old, uh, unlike the bad things, <laughs> like a sore back and, and uh, um, <clears throat> difficulties with other um, <clears throat> sensory and uh, perceptive and motor coordinative skills. But one of the good things about growing old is you remember and you have had the opportunity to deal. I remember dealing and talking with Henry Rothblatt, who handled the My Lai massacre and so on. I remember talking with Henry, uh, et cetera. So um, when people maintain their naivete and say, oh, the government, you know, we're not the Russians, we're not NKVD, KGB, we're not the Chinese, uh, we're not all those totalitarian nations, uh, Tan Tan Makuti uh, mm. in Haiti and so on. We do things always pure and noble and clean and honest and accurate uh, and so on. You know, it just isn't true. It just isn't so. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, like, um, you know, a lot of these things get hidden. Uh, the one you were talking about earlier with the Kurt Cobain case, the, the police files have been sealed and still not uh, been revealed to the public. And they're not they just pushed it again, like another 20 years. And it's right. like, hey, man, if that was true and, and you got this was a, an easy. And what's the problem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Just release well, the police. And files. That takes me back to that takes me back to JFK. Yeah, yeah exactly. Was, yeah. Which is what I about the withholding tens of thousands of pages uh, about the overall investigation by the Warren Commission report. We're holding it back for national security. Well, let me ask you guys, you're more expert at this than I am. If Lee Harvey Oswald, according to the Warren Commission, was alone, a single nut, and he just decided to kill the president, right. and under the Warren Commission report, and there are no ands, ifs, maybes, buts, howlevers, moreovers, or so on. You either buy the Warren Commission report or you don't. And if you buy the report, what you are saying is that Oswald, from the beginning to the end, had no input by anybody at all. OK, so uh, that there it is. Um, and, um, you know, he, he, you you have to then get into the details and deal with the facts. And they were withheld and they are there. Obviously, they are there as right. we came to learn later on that they had to deal with. Yeah, so in your opinion, because we've discussed this numerous times on our show, we'll start with the JFK one for you because that's when you got started. Um, uh, what was your personal belief? Um, do you th do you think it was Oswald himself? Was there somebody on the grassy knoll? Do you believe in any of that? Uh, and if not, uh, who did it? 
Um, our personal belief on the show is that Oswald yeah. did do it. There wasn't well, a person yeah. on the grassy knoll. Um, but I'm sure you look, you got, you got to see all the ins and outs of it. Uh, yeah. obviously. Well, so. gentlemen, um, I, uh, yeah, well, we, so we shall respectfully disagree with each other. Um, really? whether Oswald, whether Oswald was a shooter or not, uh, fine. I, I don't even have to get into that. It's all I have to do is prove that there was a second shooter. Right. And that is a conspiracy. And under the laws of 50 states and the federal government, two or more people involved in the planning, execution, uh, covering up thereafter of any kind of a crime makes it a conspiracy. Right. OK, so let's talk about this. You have um, to begin with the doctors at Parkland Hospital working on the president. One of them, uh, Dr. Robert McClellan, whom I had the pleasure of meeting and talking with personally. And go in yourselves and see his interview at the Sixth Floor Museum, Dallas, and see what he has to say, that he and the other doctors, about what they saw in the president's head. McClellan was holding the retractor for 18 minutes, staring right into the brain. Right, Dr. Right. Kim Clark, who was the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, he was there. What they saw, they he, saw he, damage to the back of the president's brain. Mm -hmm. They saw a piece of the cerebellum, which is located in the rear, inferiorly of the cranial wall. They saw a piece of it actually fall out uh, and so on, okay? So to begin with, then the medical examiner, Dr. Earl Rose, a board certified forensic pathologist whom I had come to know when I was in the Air Force, who was there to take control. He was the medical examiner of Dallas. They pushed him aside, they threatened him, and they took the body of the president and went to Washington, D.C. Okay, as a matter of fact, although uh, it wasn't planned, that really should have been to their advantage because it gave them time to bring together the foremost forensic pathologists in the country to do this autopsy. Keep in mind, gentlemen, multiple gunshot wounds, you have to determine entrance and exit, right. angle, trajectory, sequence, and then you have to correlate those wounds in Kennedy with the wounds in Connolly. You realize what a formidable task this is? I mean, my God, I, I can't even it'd be horrendous. Anytime I have a case, somebody's been shot multiple times, it's a very difficult task. I've done this many times, like the Diallo case, the African gentleman who was shot and killed in Washington, in, in New York City, uh, by the cops, uh, fired 17 times. Mm -hmm. I had to uh, do a second autopsy on him. Okay, so to do this autopsy, so for you guys mm -hmm. and all your listeners who mm -hmm. continue to believe the Warren Commission report, you have to begin with the evidentiary burden of answering to me and to the American public how is it for that case of the president of the United States of America shot down in broad daylight in the fourth largest city of the country with all of those things to be ascertained that we're going to call upon two career military naval pathologists, Humes and Boswell at Bethesda Naval Center to do this autopsy who had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Does that give you pause? Yes, I mean, it, it that what that tells me is they brought in a guy that would do what they said. You bet right? your ass, baby. That's exactly what it was. And by the you way, the round used to kill JFK was a six point five. Uh, uh, basically, not like a creed war, but it's it's basically copper jacket. Yeah, lead it, or ammunition. I want to talk about that. Too, it's not a very common. Weapon. It's not a very common round. Mm -hmm. No, right. The Manica Carcano, you probably know more about that yeah. than I do. The guy talked with long gun experts. Here we have a lot of hunters and shooters in Pennsylvania. Um, everybody agrees it's the most inferior weapon of his genre developed anywhere in the world. And nobody laughs at it more than the Italians. I gave this program at the Institute of Legal Medicine in Rome, and the professors there were laughing. I was embarrassed. I thought they were laughing at me. I found out later from the director with whom I had become good friends, and he spoke English. He said to me, uh, Silvio Marley, he said, no, no, they're not laughing at you. They're laughing when you talked about the manager of Gano. In Italy, the Medica Carcano is considered to be an instrument of love, not a weapon of war. Uh, so <laughs> so are, that, you, are you saying that there's multi, there was multiple shooters in the JFK there was, shooting? There was, there was a, a shooter from behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll. And then you get in now to the head wounds um, and the radiographic, the neurological, the neurosurgical, the acoustical evidence. Everything fits in exactly. And right. We've done extensive work, uh, many, many of my colleagues and research had gone over. And remember this then too, you say you continue to believe, you have to buy the single bullet theory. 
because the single voter theory is the sine qua non of the Warren Commission report's conclusion vis-a-vis -vis Oswald as a sole assassin. Without right. the single voter theory, there could not be such a conclusion. The single voter theory has one bullet going into Kennedy's back, moving upward 11 and a half degrees, having been fired from the sixth floor window, moving downward. It comes into the back. It moves up 11 and a half degrees, exits from the front of his neck, comes right. out, moving to the left and downward. Here's Connolly sitting directly in front of the president. The bullet turns in midair, comes over, hits Connolly behind the right armpit, not the left shoulder, not the left armpit, behind the right armpit, goes into the chest, pierces the right lung, destroys four inches of the right fifth rib, exits below nipple level. Look at the Zapruder film. Connolly's holding that white Stetson hat, waving to the crowd like this. The hat is at shoulder level. The bullet emerging downward below nipple level, comes out and comes up and around and goes into the back of his wrist, produces a comminuted fracture of the radius, one of the two long bones from the elbow to the wrist, a large bone, especially in a six foot four big bone Texan like Conley, exits from the front of his wrist, goes down into the left thigh, and somehow works his way out of the left thigh onto the stretcher to be found fortuitously by a maintenance man trying to get to the men's room after the presidential entourage had left. And finding a bullet on near beneath the stretcher that nobody else had seen, a 6.5 millimeter bullet. A bullet right. with a copper jacket entirely intact, no deformity at the nose, the cone, the jacket of the bullet, none at all, weighing 158.6 grains from its original weight of 161 grains, a loss of 1.5 grains, despite having left pieces of itself in four anatomic locations of Kennedy and Connolly. And that is the single bullet theory. So you accept the Warren Commission report vis-a-vis -vis Oswald? No. You, no, 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 I don't accept the Warren Commission report. I just know personally, if I was in that location, even with that weapon, I could take four or five shots in that amount of time that he took, three shots, or at least the theory that he took three shots. I know that I could, ah, put, yeah, I could easily put rounds accurately on that target from that location without any problem at all. That's, that's oh. my thinking behind it. Now, there's, there's another addition to all this that we haven't brought up yet. Um, and it's that all this stuff that was looked at through the brain and blah, 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 even if you accept all these things mm -hmm. and, as coincidence or whatever, where his brain is missing now. You guys know uh, that, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you obviously know. I that. pointed You know that his brain out. has been missing for years. Yeah. Like, 1970. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, go no, ahead. Go ahead. What, go what, ahead. What, do you know where it's at? That, that's where we're, we were no, going with this. I want to tell you that I finally voted as the first non-government sponsored, non-government related, forensic pathologist given access to all of the autopsy materials. It took quite a time to get in and do that. And that's a whole story in and of itself. I won't take the time. So anyway, I get in there in August of 1972. And there I'm looking at these agreements from Jack and Kennedy about all of this stuff being her personal property and she's giving it to the government as a gift. And then the proviso that nobody could see this stuff for 75 years, with the exception that after five years, a uh, um, recognized expert in the field of pathology with a serious historic purpose could apply. So finally I got in and there I found that the box containing the brain, mm -hmm. uh, the large metal box was no longer listed in the final inventory of October 66 and missing. And I reported that, look it up, August 24, Sunday edition, page one, New York Times, Fred Graham, top investigative reporter, president's brain missing. To this <laughs> day, as we sit here, some um, uh, 72, that's uh, 28 and 20, is 48 years, 48 years later, nobody has accounted for the brain. The brain is missing. And, and you know what? To show you the way in which this was conspiratorially contrived and covered up, there were several people who knew that the brain was missing, including top forensic pathologists and other scientists, other medical people. My old chief, where I trained in Baltimore, Russell Fisher, was a member of what is referred to as the Ramsey Clark panel that the Attorney General Ramsey Clark convened in 1968 to review the Warren Commission report's findings. Russell Fisher and the forensic neuropathologist from that office, Richard Lindenberg, um, with whom I studied brain pathology. Not one of them ever had a sense of ethics, of morality, of honesty, of objectivity, uh, of independence to comment at that time that the brain was missing. They simply put the stamp of approval on the Warren Commission. There's no way in the world. And furthermore, let me tell you something. If that were to happen in the Jones or the Smith murder case, in your jurisdiction where you are, mm -hmm. where I am, and the brain was key to the defense's 
contention that there was a second shooter and so on, and it had to be proved by examining the brain, and the brain was no longer missing. The prosecution somehow along the way, whether deliberately, yeah. it, that's called spoliation of evidence. That case is out the window. Yeah. The yeah. judge throws it out. You cannot continue with that case, gentlemen. You don't have the brain. The defendant is not able to conduct his fair defense. So there you have it uh, on the single bullet theory, on the missing brain, and on the soul assassin theory. So I'm so I'm sorry. I no, I I, I definitely you. think. Oh, frankly, my belief is that the CIA killed JFK. I think that it. Uh, you got it. Uh, you got it. Because of the Bay of Pigs, probably, but there could be more and, and complicating. Others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Voting but, rights, civil rights that he's talking about, right. the Vietnam War, the, the Cold mob. War they caught with Russia. You bet your life. Yep. There's no way they were going to sit back for five more years of John Kennedy, followed by eight years of Bobby Kennedy. They saw America going to hell in a basket. There's only one way. You weren't going to defeat Kennedy at the polls. There's right. only one way. you got to eliminate him, man. And that's called assassination. And that's called coup d'etat in America. It was the overthrow of the government. That's what it was. Now, if it's a coup d'etat... You believe because I've I've heard a lot of people express that LBJ may have been involved or at least in the know or was told later about that because he did kind of seamlessly go in and do all the things that uh, uh, JFK was going to do anyways. I mean this the uh, what let's see uh, three years into, I, or two years into his term. Uh, uh, I the Civil Rights Act got passed and blah, 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 right? I mean, a lot of stuff still happened. We, we continued to escalate in Vietnam. And a lot of stuff happened there. Do you think he was involved at all? I personally do not. Some of my fellow Warren Commission critic researchers believe that he was. I personally do not believe that LBJ was involved. However, I do believe that LBJ found out damn quick what had gone on. Um, and he, he never really believed it. And two of the good old boy uh, senators who knew something about guns who were on the Warren Commission, uh, Senator Richard Russell from Georgia and uh, and uh, Russell um, Russell from Georgia and the Boggs from from Louisiana, they never really bought it. Uh, they just signed on. Right. Uh, uh, that's that was that's the way it was. We're going to cover up. You know, the king is dead. Long live the king. Mm -hmm. You guys would know more about this than I. Don't you think that within minutes? We'll give them an hour following the assassination that by wire and direct phone and through the ambassadors in Beijing and Moscow and Havana, that uh, the inquiry was made damn soon to all of the top people there. Did you guys have anything to do with the assassination of our president? Tell us because our finger is on that nuclear button right. and there's not going to be any Beijing or Moscow or Havana in a matter of minutes if you were. They found out. In a matter of minutes, within the hour, that it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Cubans, it wasn't the Chinese. It was us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. And right. that began the cover-up. What are you going to have a revolution in America? What are you going to bring them back? It's all over. What are you going to do? And they moved on. That's yeah. what it was called. Yeah, yeah. I look. I, I agree with all of that. Um, uh, I'll leave it to folks like you who are smarter than me uh, well, to, yeah. to determine smart. whether or not there was a, another shooter uh, on the grass. You know, I love it. I love the theory, and I like conspiracies. So I'm all in for it, and uh, and I'll let that live on. Um, one of the ones that I, I actually do know a little bit about, though, um, speaking of the King is dead, is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. The death of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and whether or not that was actually James Earl Ray, my father had actually interviewed him in prison um, for oh. about 16 hours in the 80s. Um, oh. And James Earl Ray said that he definitely did not do this, that he was set up by the government and that this was somebody else. Um, uh, after this recording, uh, some of them came out a little bit later and then they did a retrial on Fox. Uh, I don't know if you were part of that uh, with the family of the King family and everything oh, else. Dr. William Pepper. Yes. Dr. William Pepper. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and they had determined that uh, James Earl Ray probably did not do this. Um, having worked on the case, what is your theory on this? I believe that James Earl Ray did not kill Dr. Martin Luther King. James Earl Ray was a, you know, a two bit thing. He never did anything of any significance as human beings. He had, he spent most of his life, more of adult life in, in, in prison on cockamamie uh, offenses. One time he escaped from the prison and uh, the car broke down. Another time the car ran out of gas. 
Now he has escaped successfully. He's living in Mexico. He's out for more than a year. And one day he decides he can't live a day longer unless Martin Luther King is eliminated. He just can't. So he knows that if he goes to Memphis, where Dr. King is trying to settle a refuse worker strike, and if he gets a room in a boarding house across the way, and he opens up the transom window at the end of the hall um, in the uh, communal bathroom there, and he looks out, that he will be facing uh, the balcony of the Lorraine Motel where King was staying. So he shoots King, and as he's leaving, he says, you know what? This isn't fair. Who's ever going to think for one moment that I, James Earl Ray, killed Dr. King? Yeah. I get it. Get <laughs> the, whole, the whole, the whole he scenario leaves, he, is ridiculous. He leaves, well, he leaves the rifle yeah, with his fingerprints. He leaves the rifle he with the fingerprints plus the yeah. package the rifle came in with his name right. and address on it. Right. I mean, come on, I'll, man. I'll throw, it, I'll throw it in the river down the sewer. He, he, it doesn't fit into his mustache. He makes his way to Canada. He's got papers of, of uh, white males about his age that would make... 007 green with envy. Yeah, no he way. goes to Canada, he travels to England, back and forth to Spain, back and forth before he's finally apprehended. That is the Martin Luther King, James Earl Ray scenario. Yeah, it's it's absolute nonsense to believe any of that, to be honest. And it's uh, any anytime things go that well in an investigation, it's almost like in a military operation. If you feel no resistance, uh, it's probably an ambush. You're probably being trapped. You know what I mean? And if, I guess, and if an investigation is super easy, you should really pay close attention to whether or not you're actually getting the facts. Because uh, it seems like people were ready to buy this. This this dude from the, not, I guess not really the South, but this dude that had some connection to racist nonsense back in the day and has had a criminal uh, background. That makes sense. That's an easily acceptable narrative that this guy went crazy and killed him okay. I mean, if you don't look any further into the, to that than that right makes sense right right and, and and for with my father on this one um because i i still have the letters and the tapes uh, after about the eighth trip to the prison in tennessee um eventually fbi came to his house and said stop asking questions yeah uh and that was it um but you know he had saved everything um what, what james roy was saying is is that he could not get anyone to listen to uh, his story, they would not let anybody, you know, talk to him or get out to the press or whatever. And then the King family was actually the one that had to step in and say, all right, we'll hear this. Let's let's go live on TV. Let me tell you something which you may not be aware of. There's a book out by a gentleman named John Currington, C-U-R-I-N-G-T-R. He was for many years, decades, the right hand man, to one of the richest men in the world, H.L. Hunt. Um, he, Carrington, has written a book. He's now a 92, 93-year-old gentleman, still living in Texas, working on his ranch. We've become good friends. Carrington took with him a valise to Percy Foreman, who was James Earl Ray's attorney then. Mm -hmm. And he said, Mr. Foreman, this is in his book. He said, Mr. Foreman, I have here 180 reasons why Mr. Hunt does not believe that James Earl Ray should go to trial. He opened up the release and there were $181,000 bills, which Currington delivered to Percy Foreman, the most eminent criminal defense attorney in America with his golden opportunity of defending James Earl Ray. And guess what? Percy Foreman pleads James Earl Ray guilty and there's never a trial and none of this that we've been talking about and so much more ever sees the light of day. That's really? All. I mean, think about these two scenarios. You have one, the JFK assassination, where uh, the commission that's hired to look into it clearly did not do a very good job, in my opinion. I right. mean, some of the outside consultants did a good job, but that information like yours, uh, Dr. White, got suppressed. So everything just lined up, though. Oswald is seen here by this person. Then he's here, and you can see this. Uh, and then, and then uh, all the stuff happens like, oh, yeah, it's clearly him. He's seen trying to escape. And then he gets shot on live television. So he never gets to ever follow up on the, the comments he made just moments earlier, yeah. which is I'm a patsy. We never got to, we never got to hear never. He said that. what that he, means. He, yeah. He, he was so impassioned as to kill the president, but not to take any credit for right, it. Right. I know that's like the yeah. idea of uh, it, in, in, in ter counter terrorism, typically speaking, it doesn't matter how disciplined an organization is. You can know within the first half hour who did it. 
because you can just listen to phone calls and things like that, or they'll just directly take credit. Now, in the other case, with Ruby, uh, uh-huh. he, or I'm sorry, with James Earl Ray, rather, he, he just leaves his gun and fingerprints, uh, a box with his name on it, and then somebody <laughs> saw him fleeing the scene. Yeah. You know how accurate eyewitness testimony is? Uh, About 30%. Very, yeah. Yeah. 30% yeah, yeah. of the time, it's accurate. Um, so you, uh, you referred to Jack Ruby, by the way, just to wrap up on, on, on that case, right. too. And where did Jack Ruby come from? He was mafia <laughs> at the age of 17 in Chicago. He's down there in, in Dallas. He's a restaurateur. Um, he's a bar owner. Uh, he's a pimp. Uh, he's he's a gun smuggler to Cuba. He's a police informant. He's a government informant. I mean, he's and living the dream down to, there. He just happens to come in to the public uh, Texas Dallas public safety building at that very moment that Oswald is being left out. Right. Okay, it just it happened like that. Yeah, I mean, it's and if, and if in that one, I've got a different theory. He fires right? one shot. If you're if you're a shooter like that, usually you don't fire one shot and put your gun down. You either try to escape or you kill yourself. I mean, we've seen so many of these uh, mass shooter or public shooting events. Almost always, it ends one of those two ways. Right. The person kills themselves, or they get taken out by somebody, or something like that. I can't with these with these. I mean, assassination is obviously different. But going into a, a building and or, or looking at a building and firing one round and then trying to escape or or walking into a room f- crowded with with federal agents, shooting a guy once and then just kind of standing there and letting yourself get tackled. Jack Ruby was a big man. Yeah. If he wanted to put up a big struggle and fire more rounds, he absolutely would have been able to do that. There's no question about it. Right? The other part about it to me with Jack Ruby is I think they found a guy who actually wanted to be famous and take the credit for it. Where, you know, uh, to me, Jack Ruby with with killing Oswald. Like, that's the guy you want, where it's like, yeah, I did this. And, you know, and in prison, at least the rumor was, he, he enjoyed he the notoriety. On, and, yeah. On bended knee mm. with Justice Earl Warren and two other members of the commission who went down there to interview him. He begged them to take him back to Washington so he could talk with them, and they refused. Yeah. So what do you think did happen with, uh, with MLK then? I mean, James Earl Ray said a couple of times that he may have been partially responsible, but... Un, unwittingly that's what he said what does that mean i mean obviously it implies a conspiracy but- yeah well i i don't know exactly um obviously um well i shouldn't say obviously perhaps he had he, he had to have some knowledge of what was coming down so um how this was to be paid off i don't know somebody arranged for him to have that uh, mustang to get him to mm-hmm. canada get him papers and so on you know where did that come from right this this Two bit nothing uh, guy. Uh, where 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 to get the money? If if somebody came to me right now and said, "Here's a million. Here's ten million dollars. I want you to go and I want you to get all of these credentials and I want you to be able to get passports that somebody looks like you." And so, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to begin. I don't know. I don't know how to start. I got to turn down the ten million dollars. But <laughs> but this guy, he knew. He knew. After spending all of his life, much of his life in prison, and then a year in Mexico. He had it all figured out. Yeah, I, it's, uh, you know, and three days later, he, he recanted his confession and all that other stuff. Uh, they also found a, a pair of binoculars at the scene with his yes, fingerprints on it. it. I yeah. mean, it was all, it, it seemed like a, Again, a Scooby-Doo in, murder mystery in, where in it was prison, just like, well, we have all the information. Yeah, in prison in the 60s or 70s, if you're a white dude that just killed MLK. Uh, you probably don't want to hide that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, I mean, you're, out to talking about these political assassinations, gentlemen, is it okay with you? I'd like to get your views and what you think about RFK. Uh, tell me what your views are on RFK. With Surin Surin, I think, uh, I, look, if you believe the premise that people in the agency were trying to shape America the way they, set, they saw fit, um, and, and there was some maybe uh, hypersensitivity to any kind of, uh, uh, I guess, socialist principles inside of America, whereas the average American doesn't understand the difference between uh, social welfare and socialism obviously right but anyways if you believe that premise with the jfk assassination or even with mlk then i mean bobby's the next guy right it's those three guys that were pushing those yeah. agendas well let me let else. me let me ask you let me ask you this to set the stage uh, remember kennedy has just won the california primary which is tantamount to being the democratic nominee for president so he can't get out of that uh, big ballroom at the ambassador hotel in la it'll take hours to get him out of there so mm-hmm. they say come on we're gonna go out the back way so as he's walking back out through the kitchen, there's Sirhan, and Sirhan shoots. Tell me, gentlemen, what is your recollection? What was the distance of Sirhan's gun from the time 
uh, at the moment that he shot uh, RFK. I don't know, maybe eight feet away. What do you think? It was? Do you know? Do you know the answer? I've done this with tens of thousands of people. Go and read the autopsy report. If you have any doubt about what I'm going to tell you right now? Okay. The shot that killed RFK, the fatal wound that hit him behind and above the right ear with a slightly forward trajectory was fired one to one and a half inches wow. behind the senator's ear. One to one and a half inches. Dr. Tom Noguchi, chief medical examiner coroner, remains a good friend of mine. Now he's 93, Tom, living in L.A. Uh, he was in charge. I was one of three civilian consultants. He had four or five members of his own staff, board certified forensic pathologists. He had three professors from USC. And at my suggestion, when Tom called me in the middle of the night because he was concerned about their spiriting the body of the senator out of L.A. like they had done with Kennedy in Dallas, I suggested to him, you be proactive, Tom. You invite them to send in three military forensic pathologists to be observers at your autopsy, which he did. Unanimous, unequivocal, setting forth, look at the autopsy report, corroborated then by ballistics experts shooting their own shots uh, with targets, as you know, that is done. Yep. The shot was fired one to one and a half inches behind Robert Kennedy's ear. You bet your life that Sirhan was a shooter, and you bet your life there was a second shooter. There's no way in the world that Oswald ever had the muzzle of his gun one and one and a half inches away from Bobby Kennedy's head and with a slightly forward trajectory. Right. So, so there you, are. Yeah, and you guys are intelligent and you're smart and you're experienced and you give me the answer that I've heard from tens of thousands of people. I love to do this with every audience that I have. What was the distance from which Kennedy's uh, uh, the, the fatal shot was fired by Sirhan? Eight feet, ten feet, six feet, four feet, two feet. Well, here, here's the no. here's the interesting part to me. So I, I shot a movie in the Ambassador Hotel um, right before it got turned down in L.A. I mean, uh, like torn down in L.A. Um, in Los Angeles. So I got to go into the kitchen uh, oh. and all that stuff to see where it was and everything else. And for for me, looking at it, if there was that many people in there. That's actually what I would have said, where the only way to get off a clean shot with that many people around him would, would to be, uh, I mean, almost directly there. Um, so what you're saying makes complete sense because when you walk through it, I don't know if you've been through uh, the Ambassador Hotel. Yes, or, I, I, I went there with Dr. Noguchi. Yes. Yeah, so, so when you're in there and you see how small it is versus how many people you saw on television when he was given that speech, I don't know how you would have gotten out a clean shot where only RFK gets killed unless you were point blank range, point blank range, exactly like you said. Well, so I mean, that makes total even, sense. Even without uh, the entry exit wound or the damage assessment or even finding the round, you could tell if somebody was shot that close just by putting liquid paraffin on their head and seeing if it turned to color, right? Because gunpowder residue is going to be very prevalent right there. That's right. That's so, right. I mean, that's a pretty easy thing to be able to tell. That was exactly. Oh, yes. This is a conclusion I'm telling you, signed off by a dozen different forensic pathologists. And incredible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I look, it was probably it was probably Jagger Hoover having a But it never it never came out of trial. You see, so people say, How is that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. The prosecution never asked Dr. Naguchi on direct testimony, and uh, the attorney, um, um <clears throat> who was an experienced Grant Cooper, a criminal defense attorney, not some uh, snot nosed kid fresh out of law school. He never, never on cross-examination asked Dr. Noguchi about the distance from which the shot was fired. Never. So that's how things happen. So Yeah, uh, I, I, and that one I agree with you. And again, I remember thinking to myself, with this many people in here, you're going to have to be real close or else you would hit somebody else. And nobody else was shot. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's... I, I'm with you on this one. I, I 100% agree. Uh, I want to move on to the John Benet Ramsey one because uh, this has been a mystery for a long time with JBR. Yeah. Um, I, I had watched the uh, the latest documentary that was out on ABC um, that, that happened that everybody got sued for uh, because they speculated they that they accused Burke, the brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Um, do do in, in your knowledge? I'm not going to ask if you believe it. I don't want you hit with a lawsuit as well. Obviously. Um, well, no. I'll, well, I'll tell you what I believe because it's in my book. Who killed John Benet Ramsey? Get the book um, <laughs> written by 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 me. Who killed John Benet Ramsey? Uh, this was not a murder. 
This was, uh, well, technically it would be a manslaughter, whatever, um, but it wasn't designed to be a murder. It was an accidental death that occurred during sexual play by the father. There was no intruder, no intruder. When you see me next and I have hair down to my waistline, like some of the NFL football players do, that's when the intruder will be found. Um, <laughs> and, and John, this is a game. Patsy Ramsey, the mother, is out of the sex business. Stage four ovarian cancer. She followed surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. And the little girl was a surrogate. And the father, uh, penile penetration, not penile penetration, I mean non-penile penetration, finger penetration, digital penetration. It's all there in the uh, autopsy. Uh, chronic inflammation, focal erosion, uh, the vaginal vault, the seven o'clock position. Um, by refringent material, the com most common source of which in any household is is <clears throat> talcum powder. Put it all together, and then you have this cockamamie note. We represent a small foreign faction. Uh, yeah, and, uh, it was Ramson, the weirdest note of all time. One hundred and eighteen thousand dollars. You like that number? Yeah, is exactly yeah. the <laughs> bonus that John Ramsey received the year before. Yeah, for, for Christmas. Not a hundred, not two hundred. One hundred eighteen thousand dollars, and then. And by the way, he forgot to bring pen and paper, but no problem. In the middle of the night, he finds pen and paper. He starts to write it. He writes. He doesn't like the beginning. He crumbles the paper, throws it down, and then starts to write again. You like that? And then he leaves the house. And by the way, he knew about the room in the basement. The homicide detective is getting there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Never even knew that room existed. Yeah. Looking for the six-year-old girl, never even knew that room was there. A maid who worked there for six months never knew about that room. But this outside intruder who was able to get in without awakening anybody, he knew about that room where he took the little girl right. and he had his way and then he left. Well, uh, usually usually people who uh, do home invasion spend a lot of time down at the city clerk's office looking up the blueprints of all the houses in the area, right? Yeah. <laughs> or is that, not, is that not how it works? Like we expect these James or Ray, all these low-level knucklehead criminals uh, to, to be, out that room they're like house, criminal right? masterminds all yeah. of a sudden. It's yeah. easier to believe they're a criminal mastermind than it is to believe that the government was somehow involved. Now, speaking of... Oh, well, well, real quick, I, how did the murder then occur with John JonBenet Ramsey? Wasn't she hit with a blunt object in the back of the head? So the father did... Funny, she was hit, but that did not kill her. Um, she had, she had um, seven cc's of blood. You know, that's one teaspoon and a half. Seven cc's. If somebody comes up right now, even with your hat on, sir, mm -hmm. and, and uh, or my bald head, and hits us with an object, you're going to have a lot more bleeding. You're going to have subdural right. hemorrhage. You don't yeah. die right away. You don't die immediately. My my son's a neurosurgeon. They operate on these people uh, hours after the bleeding has occurred. That, that bleeding was already in cause when she was dead or dying. There was no actual active bleeding. That was just oozing from a little bit of... Uh, gravitational flow from some small vessels. She was already dead. Um, Strangled? And she had she had her collar up. The rope was around the neck. Make sure that there are no marks on the neck. The collar, um, the rope came down. The sleeve was pulled down. Make sure that it never touched the skin. So there would be no indication of this. And then when you tie something around someone's neck, then you can inadvertently get a vagal reflex. The vagus nerve, the 10th, I have 12 cranial nerves coming out from the brain. One on the right, one on the left, sends fibers into the chest, controls the heart, controls the lungs. When you apply pressure to the neck, that vagal reflex can lead to bradycardia, slowing down of the heart, and then you get cardiorespiratory arrest. That is what led to the death of John A. Ramsey. As I say, a, a, a horribly, um, a horrible death, um, but by no means an intended murder. And I don't say this in any way uh, to to get John Ramsey off the hook, but to point out uh, exactly what happened. So that's John Benet Ramsey. Yes, and, and with that, because um, the mother is now deceased, uh, yes. he's still alive, and then the brothers you know, filed a million lawsuits against this. So yeah. uh, if, if you're the brother, does he know what happened? And if so, why isn't he coming forward and saying anything? I, I, I don't think he, he knows what happened. Um, in fact, when he awakened and he came down um, and uh, John Ramsey was on the phone with a relative in California, and you hear him saying to Burke, just go back to your room. John Ramsey, uh, Burke, 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 nine-year-old, three years older, uh, he came down, and he was trying to find out what happened. No, I don't think that Burke had anything to do with it. I, I, I do not believe so. 
I think Patsy obviously came to learn about it. And what was she going to do? She already lost her daughter. She's going to lose her husband. She's dying of cancer. She's got a son. So uh, you know, I go along with it. And uh, that's what I believe happened. And it's set forth in my book, Who Killed John Benet Ramsey? Yeah, it, it makes sense. Um, and now let's move on to the one behind uh, D'Anthony's uh, shoulder here, if you don't mind, the O.J. Simpson one. Now, O.J. is out, and he's still looking for the real killers, unless you think O.J. did this one. Um, this I believe is- that O.J. was present, along with a second person, whom I believe uh, to have been his son, Jason. I think there's no way in the world that O.J. Simpson could have inflicted 17 wounds on one person, 17 on the other, his wife and Ron Goldman, who was delivering glasses uh, to her from the restaurant. Um, and uh, with all the bleeding, when you sever carotid and um, and jugular veins, blood arteries, jugular veins in the neck, blood spurts, repeat, where's all the blood? They went to OJ's house, the sewers, the toilets, and the bathtub, the shower, the sinks, no blood found. One drop of blood on a, on a sock was proved to be planted, that anticoagulant material, like in a tube from a doctor's office, not blood from your vein or mine. Uh, where's all the blood? Where's the clothing? Where's the instrument? How is that all accomplished? I'm, I do believe, and my colleagues, I can speak for them on this point. We've discussed this many times, Dr. Henry Lee, Dr. Michael Bodden, that there was a second person. I believe, speaking for myself, that it was Jason who was out of control. Uh, his, um, <clears throat> his stepmother had disappointed him. She didn't go to his restaurant for the celebration that night and an ugly argument ensued. I don't know the details of that. Ron Goldman, uh, quite fortuitously and regrettably for him, happened to be there, and that is what ensued. That's the O.J. Simpson case. Yeah, because in in the one uh, doc that I saw on, uh, uh, I I think it was the ID channel, um, they had brought up the possibility that uh, it it was the son uh, along with O.J. during that. Um, Now, the cops disputed that. Um, Now, you're saying the, the... Blood was planted on the. It was one drop. It was one drop. One and it drop. Was shown by the forensic toxicologist that the defense hired to have contained an anticoagulant substance, which is not in our bloods. It is in a tube when blood is collected in the lab or at your doctor's office. So, um, so, so you do believe they, that the, the cops did plant blood on OJ's clothing? Oh, somebody, some, so, somebody planted that one drop of blood. That is right. That is what I believe. And in, in, inside the Bronco as well? I was there blood found in a Bronco. I don't recall that. Yeah, on the uh, uh, gosh, on the what's the uh, glove compartments and then well, the OJ, center OJ console. Well, OJ didn't have a small uh, laceration, didn't he? Have something? I he remember. did. Yes, correct. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes, yeah, so that's where the blood came from. Remember, he left in a couple of hours. Yep. Flew to Chicago for some appointment. So that's the OJ Simpson case. Let me tell you what my friend and colleague, Dr. Henry Lee, says. Ninety percent. White people think O.J. guilty. 90% black people yeah. think O.J. innocent. 90% Chinese people don't give a shit. <laughs> uh, is, I, I always remember that from my friend Henry Lee. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> That's hilarious. What What is the craziest case that you've personally ever well, worked on? In your well, entire, go ahead. I, I, there's, there's another major one. So you were involved in uh, concussion. And helping yes. get that uh, made, you know the. Yes, I was oh yes, yeah, yeah, the uh, so, the Will Smith movie. Chronic yes. traumatic encephalopathy. Yep. I'm portrayed in a movie by Albert Brook when mm-hmm. I was coroner of Allegheny County. Um, this um, entity was identified by one of my staff, forensic pathologist, Dr. Bennett O'Malley, who deserves the credit. And then, of course, I encouraged him and uh, and and had him move on and uh, do all the special work and and uh, incur the expenses at the office. We showed that uh, this was something related to the death. It caused the death of Mike Webster, who was the all pro center for the Pittsburgh Steelers mm-hmm. for many years. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I'm very proud of that. Um, and it emanated from the Allegheny County kind of Coroner's Office when I was a coroner in the early 2000s, uh, my second 10 year go around in that office. Uh, it's a very good movie. Will Smith does an excellent job. Uh, they screwed him out of an Academy Award nomination mm-hmm. uh no question about it a tremendous i get i came to know him and his mother who was originally from pittsburgh and gugu mabata rao who plays his wife what a lovely lovely a uh, young woman um see that movie concussion folks if you haven't seen it it's really really a wonderful movie 
Yeah, because a, a lot of veterans deal with um, uh, concussions and um, PTSD and all that stuff. Obviously, Dan's a, a, a veteran. Um, you mentioned you were in the Air Force earlier. Two uh, years in Maxwell Air Force Base. Yeah, it, was that what made you interested in, in studying concussions, or uh, why get involved in that at that time? No, no, no. I I had already made up my mind I was going to go into forensic pathology, so I uh, did two years in the Air Force. I had done two years of residency in the military. Uh, U VA hospital here in Pittsburgh first, and then I did my forensic pathology training in Baltimore. I finished my law school at University of Maryland, having done two years before the Air Force at the University of Pittsburgh. So, no, 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 the concussion thing came about quite fortuitously. I got a call from the Webster family. It really wasn't the coroner's case, but they asked if we would do the autopsy. Mm -hmm. I said, certainly. So we did it, and uh, Bennett Amato, who trained under me, he became interested in this even though he had no interest or knowledge. He's from Nigeria about sports, <laughs> one from the other, but he was fascinated. He uh, studied neuropathology and he went on to develop this and the paper was published and then everything ensued thereafter. Um, I recommend that people um, see that movie and come to learn about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You will see too, the way things are being handled now differently when someone has a concussion or is, you know, just, uh, knocked out seemingly or maybe knocked out on the ball field whether it's college or 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 pro or even high school and uh, in the pop warner league i think they uh, do not have uh, tackling uh, before the age of 12 uh, uh, until the after the age of 12 i think so people are aware of it now it's a quite different ball game yeah it, it definitely is and uh, you know i've got two kids and it's the same thing it's pretty much flag football all the way up until 12, and then you have pads and helmet where you can you know, properly yes. learn to form tackle and all of that stuff. Uh, what's the craziest case you've ever worked on? Well, that's hard to say. Uh, so many, so many cases, really. So many. I know. Many. Well, I, with you, I, I was always just curious. I mean, you know, I, look, you're obviously an expert, and we're very fortunate to get to talk to you some, with, with somebody of your stature on this show. We're usually a lowbrow show here. Um, totally kidding. Um, but uh, with you, like, I, I always wondered if, if there was one case that just stuck with you over the years where you're just like, man, I, I, oh. I didn't get this one right or they didn't get it right or somebody's not telling the truth here. It might not necessarily be the most famous case in the world, but, but one of those that just bothers you in the middle of the night. Well, the JFK case is number one for the reasons we've talked about. I'll give you one case. Uh, Rebecca Zahal, Z-A-H-A-U. This is a beautiful 33-year-old Asian woman living with her multimillionaire boyfriend in his Spreckles mansion there in San Diego. She's found hanging over a four-foot parapet from the balcony of the master bedroom at this mansion. Her hands are tied behind her back tightly. Her calves are tied tightly, um, um, so much so that there's bruising of the musculature of the calves. Um, the rope around the neck, uh, the collar pulled up, the shirt tied around it, stuffed into her neck. And she is bare ass naked, not a stitch of clothing. And they signed it out as a suicide. They refused to budge. The medical examiner, the sheriff, the cops, they refused to budge. Just before the statute of limitations ran out, the family uh, got an attorney. He fired, he, he, he filed a civil wrongful death action, um, claiming that the death was caused by uh, the, the brother of the owner of the mansion, the boyfriend who was at the hospital with his uh, young son who had suffered a head injury at the house. And uh, um, I, I testified for the plaintiff in that case, just as if it would be for the defense in a, uh, for the, in, in a murder case um, and, and so on. Uh, in any event, so I testified and the jury came in after a few hours with a verdict of $5.2 million. Wow. That case gave me great, great pleasure. And one other case passed before we wrap it up. You guys got to go, I'm sure. And I do a Cox Powell case. Look it up in Washington State in Tacoma. Um, a father whose wife had gone missing years before. Body never found, never accounted for. Uh, the kids now taken away from him, living with their maternal grandparents. And the government stupidly allows the kids to uh, visit their father. Uh, one Sunday morning, uh, the woman takes the kids there. Uh, the father opens the door, grabs the kids from her, slams the door in her face and says to the kids, I have a great surprise for you. He proceeds with a hatchet to hatchet them on their heads, their faces and their necks. Then he pours gasoline over them and himself, sets them all on fire. 
they all burn to death, the house explodes, and so on. So now there's a civil action um, for damages brought by the maternal grandparents. And I testified for them just uh, earlier this year, and the jury came in with a verdict of $114 million for conscious Man. pain and suffering of those two and four-year-old kids. Cox Powell case. Mm. Uh, I'm very proud of that case. So I'm glad to have had the opportunity to mention that. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. case and others are referred to, if I may have the liberty of again mentioning uh, my, my new autobiography, yeah, of course. The yeah. Life and Deaths of Sirowek Memoirs of America's Most Controversial Forensic Pathologist. People can read about those cases and about other things that we've talked about in the criminal justice system and so on, and as well as my background, some of my experiences, some of my trials and tribulations and travails. It hasn't been easy going always in my life and so on. It's all there uh, to be fascinating. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. You're one of the most fascinating uh, men on the planet, and we're we're grateful well, that you decided to do the show. We we end the show every uh, day with the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Well, I guess uh, to my parents. Um, really, uh, they're the ones that, especially my father. <laughs> It told me from the time I was a baby that I was going to be a doctor. And uh, so I guess he gets the number one cup. And to my <laughs> mother, who worked so hard, they were both immigrants. And mom and pop grocery store, seven days a week. Um, they're number one. My wife and my kids are number two. Um, and uh, that's really what life is all about, especially at my age. My wife and my kids and my 11 grandchildren. Without them, nothing means anything. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you uh, so much for being Gentlemen, here. I thank you, fellas, for your military experience and for the wonderful opportunity you have afforded me. Uh, you've been marvelous host. I thank you so much, and I hope we'll be together again sometime. Yes, Absolutely, sir. and please go buy Dr. Weck's book now. It is on sale. Amazon will get it to you in 48 hours. Yep. Uh, yes. Amazon Prime, Prime is the fastest available. way to do it. Yep, it's free two-day yeah. shipping. Go check yeah. out his book. Uh, thank you, sir. I know you were a busy, busy thank man, and we appreciate the time today. My, my pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome. Thank For you. Dr. Weck, D'Anthony D'Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.